All right, I just want to kind of pray again, and as we, Lord, as we open your word, Lord, as you said, Lord, your word will not return void. So, Lord, we ask that you would just open our hearts to receive it. Lord, give us uh, that understanding. Lord, just as those parables you talked about where you, the, the four different types of soil. And Lord, we want to be good soil. Soil that, that produces 160, 40 return. So, Lord, we ask for your, your grace, your ability in our lives, Lord, your continued good work, Lord, of renewing our minds by the washing of your word and, and Lord, changing us from the inside out. We give you this day and ask that you be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, this is the third uh, installment of where we're going to be talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, same terminology. And I kind of want to review a little bit from last week, <clears throat> or actually two weeks ago, whenever I taught last, uh, we talked about how in the Old Testament, the actual verbiage, you know, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven uh, is not in there. But the concept is definitely there. They were expecting a king, a Messiah to come. They were expecting a kingdom to be set up. It just didn't come in the way that they were thinking. And we even had the timing. I told you last week, or again, last time that... Uh, <clears throat> We will go back to Daniel chapter 2. We're not going to go there now. I'll just kind of give you a brief synopsis of it. But King, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he called all his wise men and magicians to come to listen to this dream because he was really troubled by it. It was a very vivid dream, and he knew it was very important. So he had them come. And by the way, Daniel and Meshach, Abednego, all those three friends of his were also considered wise men, are part of his uh, entourage of his court, and he said, <clears throat> so he asked him to interpret the dream, <clears throat> except he has a, a big kicker in there. He says, first you got to tell me what the dream was, and they're like, what? You know, no one's ever asking anybody to interpret, tell, tell you what the dream was. Tell us the dream, and, and we'll interpret it, <clears throat> and, and he says, no, uh, you tell me the dream, and then you interpret it. And if you don't, I'm going to kill all of you, destroy your houses and your families. So Daniel hears about this, and he goes, and, and he gets his three Hebrew friends, and they pray and ask God for, uh, for wisdom and, and for revelation of what happened and what the dream was. And the Lord gives Daniel the dream and the vision. And so he goes back to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and tells him, you know, there's not a man who can do this. Only God in heaven can reveal what your dream and what the interpretation was. And so he gives the interpretation, and, they, and he gives an interpretation to four different kingdoms. Uh, the first was the Babylonian uh, kingdom, which was where Nebuchadnezzar was the head. And the second one was the Medio Persia Empire, which was to come later. And then after that was going to be the Greece, Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. And then as it was divided to his four generals, and all these empires covered the known world at the time. And the fifth, or the fourth one, was the Roman Empire. And it said during this time of the Roman Empire, there would be a hand, not a human hand, that would come and take a stone, and this stone was a kingdom that will never end, and will never be forsaken, would last forever, and would be the kingdom of God. And so, from the Jewish perspective, they knew the timing. They knew that somewhere during this time of this fourth kingdom, which was, the, again, the Roman Empire, problem was uh, the Roman Empire lasted 539 years, so they didn't know when within this section. But they had an expectancy to see the kingdom of God come forth. But their expectancy was different. Their expectancy was that the kingdom of God was going to come, the Messiah would come, he would kick out the Romans, it would be a, a violent takeover, it would be very visible, very established, um, everything would change, the wicked would be, would be done, uh, dealt with, and the righteous would shine, all these different things from Scripture of the Old Testament, but they were not expecting the kingdom of God to come as it came. And 
one of my big points last time was that we would not have either. If all we had was the Old Testament, reading through those scriptures, the majority talk about what we now consider the second coming. And so this thing about a, a suffering servant coming, a, a servant, why John the Baptist was, was, uh, was struggled over it, where he sent some of his uh, disciples to Jesus and said, are you the Messiah or is there someone else to come? Because this does not look like what we expected it. And then Jesus tells them, blessed are those who are not offended at me. Because it didn't look like what you thought it was going to look like. It didn't come the way you thought it was going to come. And then the same thing with Peter. When, when he, uh, Jesus tells, tells them that he's going to be uh, handed over by the Jews, he will be crucified and, and raised in three days, and, he, and Peter rebukes him. That's pretty good, to rebuke Jesus, and say, no, that should never happen to you. And then Jesus has to rebuke Peter and say, yes. It's going to happen. And again, it's all because their mindset, their understanding, they thought the kingdom was going to be set up, and it's going to be glorious, it's going to be kicking out the Romans, setting up the Messiah to rule and reign forevermore. So when it came as it did, uh, it was a major stumbling block. In fact, that's what the word says. It's a stumbling block many times. So this week, as we continue on, this one's called Fulfillment Without Consummation. In other words, that same theme, the kingdom of God is here, but yet it's not consummated. We don't see the fullness of it yet. And we won't see the fullness of it until Jesus comes back. That's why, we, that's why bad things happen to good people. That's why evil is still running rampant throughout the earth, because it's not the consummation yet. It's here, it's growing but it's not yet here. So we're going to spend most of our time, and in, in I'm going to look at the parables that Jesus talked, because many of them, he says, the kingdom of God is like. But before we get there, I want to look at one verse in Romans, chapter 16, and verses 25 through 27. So it's the last chapter of the book of Romans. Paul says, Now to him who is able to establish you in my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Christ Jesus. So what he's saying is that this mystery of the kingdom and of the gospel of Jesus, this has been hidden. It was intentionally hidden. Again, we can go back with hindsight and read from the New Testament and say, well, but this says this and this said that. And if you put all those pieces together... But the majority, we would not have either understood, is again my point. It was something that was intentionally hidden until the time that it was released. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to, to Matthew chapter 13. But there's so many things in the Scripture that, uh, that point, because another thing that, that the Jews at the time understood, they were looking at, uh, it was... Israel-centric, or in other words, this was about Judah, and the kingdom was going to be established here. It wasn't really about the nations at all, about the Gentiles. And yet, when Jesus, you know, he sends out the 12, what do the 12 represent? The 12 tribes, obviously, of Israel. Okay, then he sends out the 70. Why did he send out 70? Because if you go to Deuteronomy, in the table of nations... There were 70 nations. This is the back of time right after the uh, uh, Tower of Babel uh, incident. So there were 70 nations, and the Jews believed that the Torah was uh, given in 70 languages. And so when Jesus sends out the 70, what he's showing, he's representing, this gospel is going to the nations. It's not anymore about Israel. This is about the world. 
So as you go to chapter 13, and verse 1, it, it, we'll start with the parable, but I'm not going to read chapter uh, verse 1 because the parable of the sower is first, and we're going to later go to where actually Jesus goes to the disciples, and he explains it rather than take the time to write, write through it. But I do want to go to... Um, and, and understanding of, of parables, too. <clears throat> Let me say something about that, because I always understood parables as, uh, as allegories. Pa- but parables aren't allegories. You know, allegories, you write a story, and there's a whole bunch of different facts within that that point to something, you know, that making a different point. A parable is something that's taken from everyday life, and it's usually met just for one ap- application. Everything doesn't necessarily mean something, in other words. And it, it has to be set in the setting of Jesus' life, in other words, during his time. So if we go down to, uh, to chapter 10, or, or chapter 13, verse 10, because after he gives the parable of the sower, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? In other words, why don't you just go A, B, C, D, E, explain it? And he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Now that's kind of a hard verse, but you have to realize that it's really, there's two different things going on here. There's, there's human responsibility, but there's also God's sovereignty. And it says, whoever has <clears throat> will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they may see with their ears eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth that many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. So the Word of God, uh, it forces the decision. And unless you have spiritual eyes or spiritual ears, it, it's just not going to click with you. And it, it forces the decision because that same parable or that same teaching can either impose life or it can harden your heart and impose death. Because you have to have spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to understand it. Now, the first part of that, uh, back in verse 13, is actually quoted from several different sources. One is uh, Deuteronomy, I'm not going to turn there, but just so you have a reference. Deuteronomy 2, 29 and verse 4. And it's repeated in Jeremiah 5, verse 21 and Ezekiel 12, too. So there's several different references where he's, he's quoting that. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. So they're physically hearing, they're physically seeing, but they're spiritually not seeing and they're not hearing. And so <clears throat> I want to look at another verse, kind of keep your finger there because we're coming back. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Paul kind of addresses this same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 18 through 25. And so Paul says, For the message of the cross 
is foolishness. Think of that. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligent intelligence of the in, intellect I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? God is, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we, cre- but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who God has called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So the message of the cross is foolishness to many. And so sometimes you have to realize that we are, we are told to witness, to give our, our testimony, to witness to people, but I think you also have to realize a lot of times you will do that and people, it's foolishness. Other people you will talk to and, and it will strike their heart because they have spiritual eyes and ears to hear and the Holy Spirit will touch them. On our, I want to look at Luke 13 as we go back towards Matthew to kind of give you a little bit more Luke 13 and verse 22 through 24. It says, then Jesus went through the towns and villages. He was teaching... As he made his way to, towards Jerusalem, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. So this person, this disciple, asked Jesus, because he's observing what's happening. Jesus is teaching in the villages, there are multitudes coming and that are receiving the word, but the majority are not. And so this person asked, are only a few being saved? You know, in other words, is only a remnant actually receiving the word? And then that's when Jesus says you must enter by the narrow, the narrow gate. It's true. So again, we should not be discouraged when sometimes, again, we witness and don't get the response that we think we should get. And also another thing is to realize that some of the people who you think would never respond can be the very people who respond. Sometimes we look at people, you know, in our natural senses, and we think, well, that that person's so far out, no no way, and that's the very person who does. It's kind of like that when Jesus was ministering, he said, he says the, to, the, to the scribes, the Pharisees, he says, you guys are, uh, you refuse to repent. But the prostitutes and the tax collectors, they're coming in before you. Because the, the, uh, the Pharisees thought in their own righteousness, they didn't, need, they didn't need forgiveness. They didn't need a Savior. Well, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, they knew they were in trouble. And so they were willing to come into the kingdom of God. And one more, since we're going back to Matthew, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. And then we will get back to, to Matthew 13. But verse 13 and 14, same example. 
But Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. So again, many times it's a remnant. Even though we're expecting a revival and a great end time harvest, which may bring in a, a billion souls, it's still a remnant in comparison to the total population of the world. But our job is to witness. Our job is to represent Christ and His kingdom. All right, so let's go down back to Matthew 13, and we're going to look at the parable of the sower in verse 18. So after Jesus has told them why he speaks only to them in parables, then he says to take his disciples by themselves, and he, he gives the interpretation in verse 18. He says, then listen to what the parable and the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Now this is the seed sown along the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on a rocky place is like a man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. Now the one who receives the seed that fell upon the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of his life Worries of this life and the decept- deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who receives the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word, understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So Jesus gives it an interpretation. And again, when I, when I used to look at these more as an allegory, I'd look at each of those different types of soil. And I always thought myself uh, that the one who th- received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of life and the seedfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. I always thought of that as the primary cause, but really in this parable, it wouldn't matter whether there was two types of soil or six types of soil. It, it, wouldn't change, it wouldn't change the bottom line. You know, bottom line is the kingdom of God has come into the world to be received by some and rejected by others. And so as Jesus is teaching these things, it, it's really a real... Uh, conundrum for the apostles, the Jewish people of the time, they're thinking, you know, this is not what we thought. This is not coming to pass the way we thought it was. So let's look at verse 31. The mustard seed, because the parable of the weeds, uh, he's going to explain also privately to them, so we're going down to 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Okay, this is what he's telling them. This is what this looks like. Which a man took and he planted in a field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, although it's not really the smallest of all seeds, but for the point. Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and purchase in its branches. So again, he's talking about it's the kingdom of God. This is not happening like you guys thought. This is happening starting very small, and it is not really perspect, you know, known by a lot of people, and it's kind of going quietly within the hearts of men and women. They're being transformed from the inside out. Instead of this big, you know, this big 
calamity happening and this revolution and a kingdom being set up by power, it's working secretly in the men's hearts. And it's starting very small. And there was no understanding of that from the first century Jews. They were not, again, that's not what they were expecting. So it took a, a major paradigm shift. Now, in verse 33, it's very similar. He said, he told them still another parable. The kingdom is like yeast that woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. So again, given a picture of, of something small is put in a not really perceptible in looking at it, but it works its way all through the dough. So it starts small, and it begins to fill the whole earth. It also increases in, uh, not just in quantity, but also in quality. At least it should be within each of us. You know, when each of us came, gave our lives to the Lord, we didn't instantly become probably where we are now. It was a process of us maturing in the Lord, of being uh, renewing our minds and growing in the things of the Lord. So it didn't happen overnight. It was gradual in both quality and quantity. And I had worked down a question because I think this is the question that many of, of, of the people at the time would have been asking because Jesus preached that the presence of the kingdom of God was here. Okay? But the world went on just as it had before. They couldn't really see that much of a change. How could this then be the kingdom? Again, the idea of a kingdom conquering the world by a gradual process and by inner transformation was completely foreign to their thoughts at the time. And again, I want to emphasize, it would have also been our thoughts too. So then we go on to the parable of the weeds, where Jesus explains, again, he takes them aside, and he speaks to them privately. He said, then he left the crowd and went to a house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parables of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is a world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. Now the harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. Now when he actually gave that parable, back in verse 24, he said that the owner, servant, came to him and said, sure, should we, or let's see, what verse? Do you want us to pull them up? So in other words, he's saying, do you want us to get the roundup and spray the field? You know, and he said, no, because when you spray, you're going to also kill some wheat. So leave them until the end of the age, and our Heavenly Father so will send forth his angels, and he will separate the evil from the righteous. Now, you can use that a little bit and say, well, hmm, at the end of the age, we're all going to be here, but don't read too much more into the parable than, than actually what it says. But he said, that's how it's going to be. From now on, there's going to be, there's going to be tares or weeds, evil and good in the kingdom, the world. It hasn't changed. It's still going on. Bad things are going to happen. Good people are going to have some negative things happen to them. People are going to die. In fact, it says what the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So until that time, until Jesus comes, we're going to 
be living in this age of mixture in a way. And we are supposed to expand his kingdom and be representatives of the light against the darkness. Okay, then we go down to verse 44. And it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Now when a man found it, he hid it again. And when in his joy, he went and sold all he had, and he bought the field. Go ahead and read 45. And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one with great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it which is just talking about the value of the kingdom. If it costs us everything, it's worth it to be in the kingdom of God. It's worth all. Anything that we, it would cost us is in no comparison to being in his kingdom and the future that we have. So all of these parables, you know, there's a parable of the net. Let's go ahead and read it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that let down to a lake caught all kinds, of, all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it to the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in a basket, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come, separate the wicked from the righteous, and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be whipping and gnashing of teeth. So again, just showing that picture, until that time, until the time of the culmination of the coming of Jesus, return of his kingdom being set up. There's going to be evil and righteous all living in the world together. We're in this place of mixture, and yet we are to shine brightly. Uh, I've got time for one more. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Because this, this one... <clears throat> I'm going to look at the uh, parable of the, of the tendons. It's in verse 33 of Matthew 21. And this one's a little different because it's not only a parable, but it's also a prophecy of what's going to happen. Because this is towards the end of Jesus' ministry. And he says, and listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Now he put a, a wall around it. He dug a wine press in it. And he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. Now when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. Now, vineyard is often used in the Old Testament uh, pointing to the, the nation of Israel. And it says, The tenants seized his servants, they beat one, they killed another, and, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. So this is, again, a picture. The Lord had sent prophet after prophet, warning Israel, getting to turn back to the Lord. And it says in verse 37, Last of all, he sent his son to them. Obviously, Jesus. They will respect my son, he said. But when the the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, Now this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? So he's speaking, by the way, to, to the scribes and Pharisees. He asked them the question, okay, tell you this story, what will the owner do? And they answered, he will bring these wretches, 
He will bring these wretcheds to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at the harvest time. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scripture the stone, here we are again with the stone, the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Verse 45, when the chief priest, the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid because of the crowd, because the people held them, held that he was a prophet. So he gives them this parable. They answer it, what, what should happen in this case. And it's like, it's kind of like uh, with, with David and, and Nathan, when Nathan came, came to David and told him the story about the lamb, you know, that this wicked man, rich man, had taken from this man who had nothing else but one lamb. And then David was so upset, and then Nathan said, you know, you're that man. Well, it's the same thing in this case. The Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, he's saying, this is about you. This is about you have rejected the kingdom of God. You look good on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones in the inside. And this this prophecy was completely fulfilled in 70 A.D. by the Romans. He brought it was you know again that was the tool of the Lord. He used the Romans to come and destroy Jerusalem, the temple, and over a million Jews were killed in that time. And that's why he when he's being led to the cross, and the women are weeping behind him, he says. Don't weep for me, weep for yourself, because he knew what was coming. And so this is not just a parable, it was actually a prophecy of what was going to happen. And that this kingdom will be given to others, which are those who believe, whether they're Jew or whether they're Gentile, those who come into the kingdom of God. And so again, we find our place living in in this place of where there's evil, there's good. And as you look at the signs of the times, it seems like things are really accelerating on both sides. We are, you know, entering, I think, a, a very dangerous time, a time where things, evil is going, going to get darker, but the light is going to shine lighter. And we're going to be living in that age. But that means we're also getting closer to the return of the king, the king who will return and truly set up the kingdom of God upon planet earth, bringing heaven, the new Jerusalem, down to the earth. And everything will be changed. No more death, no more dying, no more sin. It will all be eradicated, and we will live in perfect harmony with our Lord and our Savior. But again, in the meantime, we're living in this place, and it's a real tension. And sometimes it's a paradox. We pray for people. Sometimes we see them healed. Sometimes we don't. Because it's not the fullness yet. But our job is to expand the kingdom, to keep growing it. So again, I just want to encourage you guys today that, you know, just as, as the, the Jews of that time were not expecting the kingdom to come in that way, it did come in that way. It came in, the, in a way that was... It was not big and flamboyant. It was something that happened pretty much silently in a way. You know, it says, prophecy says, he did not raise his voice in the cities. It, it came working in men's lives, in the inner man, working inside out, and changing society over a time, a gradual thing that grew. And that is why, you know, you, you think of Paul. I always wondered why he was so so uh, set on going to Spain. 
he writes to Romans and he says, I've got to get to Spain. So I hope to see you on the way, but I want to get to Spain. And the reason was because back in that original uh, 70 nations, Spain, which had a different name at the time, was the farthest west. And so he felt like if he got there, he would complete his mission of spreading the gospel to those 70 nations, which now obviously has spread across the world and has 200 and some nations. But that was his heart. He wanted to fulfill that, that prophecy that he would go to places that Lord had not been preached. And it was at that time, Spain was the farthest of the 70 nations that were listed. And so that should be our heart, you know, as we go. You know, we just had the send, which obviously met trying to encourage people to go to the nations. But it's not just to the nations, it's to our neighbors, to, it's to the people you meet at Walmart, it's people in the school, whoever it is. We are to expand that kingdom. Wherever we are, you know, it just says go. Not necessarily where, but wherever you go, Take the kingdom with you and be a representative of the kingdom. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that, Lord, we are citizens of your kingdom. Lord, with all the rights, all the privileges that go with that. And most importantly, Lord, that we have eternity to spend with you. That there is a king that is returning. And, Lord, that as we begin to get closer and closer to that time, Lord, cause an expectancy to grow in our hearts. Lord, cause a hunger to long for the things of the kingdom. Lord, to see the kingdom of darkness replaced by the kingdom of light. Lord, to make inroads into the kingdom of darkness, Lord. To take more and more territory. Lord, you have given us an inheritance that we are your sons and your daughters. Lord, you loved us before we loved you. And Lord, I thank you for everyone in here, Lord, who had those spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to hear, to see, Lord, that have been brought into your kingdom that we've been brought out of the kingdom of darkness, we've been brought into the kingdom of light. And Lord, we rejoice in that. And Lord, I ask for your empowering of us, Lord, as we walk in this evil generation, as we walk in a time of trouble, of shakings, Lord, that our light would shine brightly. Lord, that we would not faint or draw back, but Lord, that we would be aggressive, that we'd be some of those violent men who take the kingdom of God by force, that we go forth, Lord, expanding your kingdom. For, Lord, we know this, this life is just a drop in the bucket. But, Lord, eternity. Lord, you said in, that you have placed eternity within men's heart. So, Lord, we're longing for that. We're longing for the fullness of the kingdom. We say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. We long for your coming. We long for your kingdom to be established. And Lord, we say we love you. We thank you, Lord, again, that you loved us first. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.